<laughs> hmm. Okay, we're going to get started in just a moment. Hope you all are having a, a fine week. be talking about tonight is sin within the family from Malachi chapter number two verses 10 through 16 the prophet begins hey Pat hi Juanita the prophet is beginning this section with three questions do we not have one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? One Father. He's talking about the fact that God is the father of the nation. God is the father of the people of Israel. It's, he's not talking about Abraham. Israel was like God's firstborn. In fact, he uses that in Exodus. Well, he, he uses the fact that of, of the, the imagery of the sun in Exodus 4.22, when God tells, tells Moses, thus Yahweh says to Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. In Hosea 11.1, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I've called my son. In Amos chapter number 3, verse 2, you only have... I, of all the clans of the earth, therefore I, and, and, and the idea is, I have chosen you out of all the clans of the earth. And he says, in through the prophet Amos, I'm going to punish you. Just like a father does his own children. Now, what is this meaning, the idea of profaning the cup? excuse me, the covenant. He is talking about the fact that, let me just state it this way. How you treat other people is how you treat God. How you treat other people is how you treat God. Now look at a New Testament reference that backs that idea up. It comes from Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. And it's the imagery of the, of the judgment where God is separating the sheep and the goats. And in this idea, goat does not mean greatest of all time. The key verses, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You welcomed me in as a guest, naked, and you, uh, you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to see me. The righteous are going to answer, Lord, when did we see you? these in this way when did we see you hungry or feed you thirsty give you something to drink when did we see you a stranger and welcome you in and the lord says the least that when you've done these things to the least of my brothers you've done it unto me and there's another group that Jesus says, you didn't do this to me. And, and they say the same thing. Lord, when did we see you and not do these, these things? 
And Jesus responds, in as much as you did not do these to the least of these brothers of mine, you didn't do it unto me. So Malachi is, is speaking about the fact that Israel, you know, they have one God, one father. And we got and, and we have no business dealing treacherously with each other. And in verse 11, he goes on to explain how an example of how they have de uh, dealt treacherously. And it says, Judah has dealt treacherously and, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. Now, listen to this. This is, you need to grab this. You need to grasp onto this. He's not talking about the temple or the altar when he uses the term sanctuary. He's not talking about the Holy of Holies. He's talking about the sanctuary of one's own body. Remember, our bodies, we are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was to dwell within Israel also. Now, granted in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit selectively indwelt people. It was not always indwelling of all people at all times and all places. But the point is that this sanctuary of the body is to be clean. It is to it, it it is to be used for the glorification of God. But what did they do? Instead of glorifying God, they married foreign individuals. Now. You know, this, how can God have a holy people if they intermarry and become idolatrous? You know, we're to be holy and blameless. We talked about this in Ephesians. That's those very words are in Ephesians chapter number one. We're to walk holy and blameless before God. And the same was true <clears throat> with Israel. <clears throat> they were to keep their own personal sanctuary, clean. But unfortunately, they sinned by intermarrying. Now, again, let's look at a New Testament principle. Second Corinthians chapter number six, verses 14 through 18. Do not become unevenly yoked with unbelievers. For what participation is there between righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or what share does a believer have with an unbeliever? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? 
for we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will live in them and will walk about among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the all-powerful Lord. Now, there are some verses there that Paul quotes from that come right out of the Old Testament. When he says, I will live in them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, they will be my people, come out from them. From their midst, be separate, says the Lord. Why is this such a difficulty where the people of God, professing Christians, are dating, marrying unbelievers? This is bad news, folks. This is bad news. This was the problem in the Old Testament because Israel, not long after Joshua's death, they started intermarrying. They started allowing, and, and God specifically says, don't do it. Why? Because they'll turn your hearts away from me. And ultimately, these marriages crept into the actual temple. Solomon built idols to false gods from the women that he married. And they sacrificed to false gods, and it got so much more worse than that. And I've discussed some of this already to the point where a person like Manasseh would sacrifice his own child to Molech, his own baby. Now here's a, the next verse. Verse 12, those who profess to love God and bring offerings to God yet practice idolatry, let them be cut off. This is Malachi's curse. He says, as for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. These individuals who have married idolatrous following women and have brought the practices into their home and that has caused the family to become idolatrous, Malachi is giving a curse to be cut off from Israel. Verse 13, are we guilty? Now, let me read the verse. This is another thing that you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Are we guilty of approaching God in a way that does not honor God and expect God to bless us? Is our worship sometimes a performance for others to see? Are we doing our duty to God? Or are we willingly 
offering to God our best? Are we in worship and in lifestyle demonstrating our love for God? Now, I want to take you back. I want to take you back to Genesis chapter number four. Starting in verse three, in the course of time, Cain brought an offering from the fruit of the ground to Yahweh. Abel also brought an offering from the choicest firstlings of his flock. And Yahweh looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But Cain and to his offering, he did not look with favor. Cain became angry and his face fell. Yahweh said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen or why is your countenance falling? If you do well, will I not accept you? But if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. But you must master it. Verse 13 of uh, Malachi 2 indicates that these were the tears of men who after divorcing their Israelites wives, Israelite wives to marry pagans, found that the Lord was no longer accepting receiving their offerings. And so they're crying out. They're crying to God. Why don't you accept my offering? They're, they're doing the same thing that Cain was doing. Why aren't you accepting my offering? Well, if you do well, won't your countenance be lifted up? Stop marrying individuals who do not know God. Start being obedient to what God says. And they're, they're still belligerent. You know, here we come to verse 14 where Malachi is just pointing it completely out. Um, that, you know, they say, for what reason? Why aren't you accepting our offering? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously. Wow. Treacherously. Though she is your companion and your wife of the covenant. Marriage is not a contract. Marriage is not an agreement. Marriage is not something as pastors say, not to be entered into lightly or unadvisedly, but it is a covenant. It is a covenant between you, the spouse, and God. And these individuals, these men, were divorcing their wives to marry some young thing, if I could say that, and had forgotten the wife of their youth, the wife that God gave them, the wife of the covenant they made with God. Here is the example of illegal intermarrying with foreigners. Now, does God hate foreign people? Non-Jews? No. 
God hates idolatry. Israel profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, their own bodies, and God was, he was holding them accountable for what they were doing. And so he was not regarding their offering anymore. Now, verse 15, he says, not one has, but not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. There we go, a remnant. There were individuals in Malachi's day who were still honoring God. God always has a remnant. And these individuals, the spirit of God was upon. Their worship was acceptable. Their offerings were acceptable. They were being obedient to what God said. And here's the reason why God was not wanting them to intermarry with individuals who were not Israelites. He is, what, and what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? God was in the process of protecting the seed of the woman that is spoken of early in Genesis. You shall bruise his heel, but the seed of the woman will crush your head. And so he is protecting the people of Israel to give birth to Messiah. Now, we're not supposed to be intermarrying with non-believers for the same reason God told Israel not to, because they'll take your heart, they'll turn your heart away from him. Oh, but he loves me. Yeah, he does. He may very well. But ladies, there'll come a point in time that he might not like it that you're going to church. He might even forbid it. Is that what you want? He says, take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of of your youth. Guard yourself. Guard yourself in your spirit. Means to have some, the same desire for the covenant unity that the Holy Spirit seeks, which would mean not violating the marriage, the, not violating the marriage covenant. Because the nation is one. No husband, Malachi said, should break faith with the wife of his youth. Israel was to be a light unto the Gentiles. We are to be a light to the world. And our light is not going to shine very well if we are constantly compromising what we say we believe in God. And one huge compromise that has taken place in our society, within the church, 
verse 16, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord God of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Verse 16. This is not Malachi's opinion. This is not James Holzapple's opinion. This is God directly speaking. God hates divorce and the one who acts treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now, are, are, there, are there reasons for divorce? Of course. But not for some young thing. And the majority, the, the biblical reasons that Jesus Christ has allowed and even says for the hardness of your hearts is idolatry or is adultery. And yet one of the worst things that's happened in our society happened in the late sixties, early seventies, and we call it no fault divorce where people just say, well, I just don't love them anymore. I can't live with them with her anymore. And we'll just go our separate ways. And we see that, all you got to do is watch uh, Entertainment Tonight or Access Hollywood or some of these and find out what couple is splitting up and, and you know, how these individuals are, are celebrating the, the demise of, some, of a marriage. And this idea of... of the one who covers his garment. You have that imagery in Ruth where Ruth had, had uh, covered Boaz's feet. And it, it's, a, uh, it's an image of, of marriage. She was offering herself to him as a wife. And Boaz had to accept that. And before he accepted Ruth, he went to make sure that there were, if there were any closer other relatives that would, would uh, marry Ruth. And either none were found, I'm not remembering this right now as, as accurately as I should, but the fact is Boaz took Ruth as his wife. And if you look in the genealogical uh, line of Christ, you know, she was a foreigner, but she became, she was a believer. There's a big difference. She was in the line of Jesse and of the line of David, and ultimately in the line of Christ. And here's that warning again. Take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God is watching. God is paying attention. God is noticing what we do. And if we're going to worship God in truth and in spirit, as John 4 talks about, Jesus with the woman at the well, that that kind of individual is whom God searches out for worship, we need to make sure that we are on the up and up that this temple of our bodies is being kept and is honoring God 
in what we do. What we do, what we say, how we act, how we treat people. Because again, God looks at how we treat people as how we treat him. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your week. And I pray that the Lord blesses you, causes his face to shine upon you, is gracious unto you, and gives you peace. Until next time, I hope that you have a good night. And we shall see you. Good night.